that people hit a certain chord. It's like, what does all this do and how could I even do anything interesting with it? Um, and I, I kind of fell into this project and it was really easy and really cool and so I thought I'd share it. Um, so what we're going to do is talk to you how I kind of bought one of these cheap um, RFID lock sets off of eBay. Uh, they're about 12 or 15, well, 12 dollars you can buy now. Um, uh, it's kind of standalone. Uh, I'm going to pass this one around. It's already broken, so break more. That's just fine. <laughs> it's got tiny little wires holding the uh, holding the board to the antenna, and if that, those aren't broken by the time it gets back to me, I'm very disappointed, you guys. Um, <laughs> so yeah, 12 bucks gets the RFID keys and all that. Um, and I bought this after we're using our Prox Market at a at a demo that we were doing. It's really hard to use the Prox Market. You know, like the tiny better antennas and. You know, bought this thing, got it open, like, oh, this board actually looks kind of simple. Um, you know, so that's kind of the first step of, of kind of hardware hacking, is just looking at the board. Um, and you first look at it, you've never been in there before, it's like, what are, all, what are all these things on here? What do they do? And I'm going to talk through some of those. Um, so, the first thing I, I saw on there, because most boards have it, and I recognize it right away as a voltage regulator. Um, so, um, that's a component, it's this little uh, square thing there. Uh, you can see there's printing on it, um, you know, the one on the board in the green there says 78M05. So, most part numbers have a uh, uh, standard manufacturer, or have a part number on them. If they're made by many manufacturers, a lot of times they'll have the same part number across different manufacturers. So, for that, you know, little, just that one component, I could go on the web, find the data sheet. Um, you know, don't be afraid of data sheets, you know. They look a little daunting, but if you spend a little time looking at it, you start to understand. Um, you know, and I, I went right to the electrical characteristics, and I'm interested, okay, the output voltage on that is 5 volts. So that's what tells us something interesting. Um, even though the input on the board itself says it requires 12 volts, um, the circuitry, the, the computer circuitry on there is most likely using a 5 volt uh, power supply, so I want to use 5 volt, you know, I want to look for 5 volt signals or partial 5 volt signals or things like that. The other thing I can see from the data sheet here is the VI for that 5 volts is actually 7 to 20 volts. So I don't need to use 12 volts. I could use a 9 volt battery to power the board. Um, and the, the board itself would still get the 5 volts if I can use anything down to 7 volts. Um, it's likely they require 12 volts because they use the same feed to feed like the lock sets. And I assume those door lock sets run on 12 volt DC. Uh, but if they're not actually running a lock, they just want a light on the lock uh, on where the lock would be like an LED. Um, you know, a 9 volt battery that would be fine. So even just that one little component, I can learn some interesting things. It's 5 volt, I don't need to use 12 volt, I can use 9 volt power supply if I've got it, things like that. So um, that's a bit about data sheets. I'm going kind of fast because I got a lot of slides. Um, next thing I saw was this big chip in the middle of the microprocessor. I uh, never heard of Nubaton before, got a big long part number. I looked it up and just kind of looked through the, the, the preamble on the data sheet. Um, I, can, I see it's an 8051. That's something I've heard before, but I've never programmed it. But maybe I can figure out how. You know, I program an Arduino, and that's about it from a microcontroller standpoint. Uh, but it's got RAM on board and all that. And then I get down to the bottom, and it says, "Oh, it allows the programmers should have done that. R allows the program memory to be uh, read. Like, well, that's cool. Maybe I can actually read off the memory and start tampering with it and catch the signal that it's seeing or whatever. And then I see the next line. It says, "Once the code is confirmed, there's security. Okay, so maybe I can't get the code." I'll put that aside for later, but I at least know about, a little bit about the chip and, and things like that uh, at this point. And the data sheet actually says what each pin on it is for, and I can start tracing the pins to where they go. Uh, I didn't really do much of that. Um, looked around the board some more. Uh, you'll see a lot of integrated circuits. You can look up the data sheets for those. This one's just a hex inverter. Um, I don't know what it does. It's not very interesting to me. Moved on. Um, here's another chip on the board, a little memory chip. So it looks like a 32K memory that uh, 24 h is 32. Again, I can pull up the data sheet for it. Um, that's something I can like to read or write. Um, but as I'm thinking about it, okay, my goal is to have someone swipe a card and I want to intercept their number. Well, it's not likely when someone swipes a card that the process is going to send the card to memory. It's going to read cards from memory, maybe. So maybe that's something else. But uh, at this point, I was just trying to find a way that someone's going to you know, swipe a card. Um, I can I can grab their grab their ID when they swipe it. Uh, other things on the board like capacitors you're kind of familiar with. What are they used for really? So you see these big round ones up in the top corner. Um, you know those are on the board. They're right near the, the power input. I'm assuming they're just for power conditioning. So they store a little extra charge. And as 
as different components use different charges, it kind of keeps it even. Um, and then you see the same thing right here next to that hex, hex in, uh, inverter that we saw. Uh, this C13 in the second picture is another capacitor. It's connected right to the power pin of that one. And again, it's right next to the component, but it's still doing power conditioning. So there's just a constant, uh, you know, 5 volt voltage going into that, and that capacitor just kind of flicking up, keeping that even. And then finally, you know, especially for an RF circuit like this, uh, capacitors are used, you know, in conjunction with an inductor. An inductor is just a coil wire. Um, so you take a coil wire and a capacitor, put them together, and you've got a, a circuit that will resonate at a certain frequency. Um, and that's what we see on the bottom here. The two little tiny wires on the bottom are, uh, are the antenna coil that goes around the board. Um, and then the, um, the green thing here is another capacitor that's on that circuit, so I assume it's helping that resonate. Resistors, there's resistors all over the board. They're used for lots of different things. Um, so voltage dividers. Uh, the way a resistor typically does is it, it drops the voltage. You use two of them, like the picture on the side. Um, you know, V out is going to be some partial percentage of what V in is. Um, you know, so you can reduce your voltage. Uh, often you'll see them for uh, protection. Uh, so if you've got different signals, you'll put uh, kind of low value resistors on that. So that if someone puts a uh, you know higher voltage on there, should be something like that. It's going to limit the current that goes into your chip. Uh, they're used for pull ups and pull downs a lot. When I started playing with kind of hardware hacking like this, uh, I saw that people in, who know what they're talking about use that term a lot, but I had a really hard time finding someone describing well what it meant. Um, and so that I, just, I got stuck on that for, for some days or longer. Uh, but pull ups and pull downs, um, the way it works, so you guys are probably familiar with kind of the Arduino card here, it's got input pins where you can input a signal. And your input signal is either, you know, if I, if I stuck a wire on one of those input pins, I can touch to ground and that's going to mean a zero, or I can touch it to positive voltage and that's going to mean a one. So zero, one, zero, one. But if I just leave that wire hanging out here, uh, anybody know what that'll read on the Arduino? It, it, it's random, it reads whatever, it, 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 there's, no, there's no signal. Um, but it will read a zero or one, it's got to read something. Um, that's where pull-ups or pull-downs come in. Um, in addition to that wire that I'm not touching to anything, I would have a resistor going to either ground for a pull-down or going to positive voltage for a pull-up. And if that when the wire's not touching anything, that pin's going to be whatever signal that resistor's connected to. So it's going to be a zero if I've got it pulled down. It's going to be one if I've got it pulled up. But then when I go and touch this to something, then it's going to be whatever I touch it to because the, the resistance of my wire is much less than that resistor. So the wire takes precedence at that point. If I touch the voltage, now it becomes a one. If I touch the ground, it still stays in ground. So they're important to know about, especially when you're starting to build circuits with the Arduino, to know, okay, am I actually getting a signal in there? Or are there, are there times that I'm not giving it a signal, but I'm reading a signal? If that's the case, you want to add a pull-up or a pull-down to give it kind of the default. You always want it to be zero unless it touches the positive, or you always want it to be one unless you touch the ground. So that's pull-ups and pull-downs. Uh, here's a quick picture of some service mount resistors. I'm guessing these are pull-ups or pull-downs because they're kind of an array and they're near the push buttons. So when the button's not pushed, it's probably pulled down, and when they push the button, you know, it's going to bring the signal up. Uh, very simple little yellow relay on there. Uh, all that is is a switch that this, the logic from the processor can turn this kind of, it's actually a physical switch in there. You can hear it click when you turn it on or off. You'll hear the solo note in there click on or off. Um, and that tiny little component is, you know, size of my thumb tip, uh, but apparently it's a 250 volt AC component even, so um, that was interesting to me. Uh, diodes all over the board. Um, I, I've never really had to deal with what is this diode doing when I've been doing this stuff. I know they're used to make sure current only flows one direction to protect things. Um, there's clamp, clamp diodes that make sure you can't enter, or only a certain voltage will go through a circuit, other ones will be clamped off the ground or whatever. And your LEDs are diodes as well. Not really interesting from a lot of perspective. Um, there's a little crystal on there. You see that on almost every board. Um, it's just a little uh, piece of uh, quartz or something that, that oscillates to create your, your signal. Um, I can see that this one's 12 megahertz. That's a little interesting because I just want to know, okay, what is the clock cycle of that processor? Uh, my Arduino, I think, is 80 megahertz. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong. So my Arduino is faster than that. Well, that's something good for me because then if I'm going to write code in the Arduino, it's going to be at least as fast as the processor that's in there uh, that's running at 12 megahertz. 
Again, I, I have no electrical engineering background. A lot of what I say is probably crap, and people can call me out on that, that's fine. Um, I learned as I went, and that's what I kind of want to share with people. Um, transistors. Um, so this is the three pin part um, that you basically current flows through it, but the third pin on it tells the current whether or not to flow, um, you know, and it can let some throw, flow or all throw, flow through. Um, they can do it based on voltage on that kind of, they call it the gate pin or on the current on the gate pin. But just basically, uh, really often in, in these electronic circuits, they're used to switches. Uh, we can see these little black things towards the top of the picture there are two transistors. I'm assuming they kind of look that close, but I'm pretty sure they are, uh, that are turning those LEDs on or off. So you're not feeding um, current right to the LED uh, from the from the processor, from the chip. You're feeding a signal from the chip to that transistor that tells that transistor to turn that flow on or turn that flow off. And that way you're not feeding a lot of current through your chip, through your processor chip. So, first tool I used, a uh, multi-tester. Uh, you definitely need a multi-tester. Um, even if you're not going to use a multi-tester, um, I, I don't know how anybody would get away without having one. Um, this is the one I use. It's five dollars at uh, Harbor Freight Tools. If you're lucky enough to have Harbor Freight Tools nearby, I like five dollars at Harbor Freight Tools because I, I burn them out a lot by doing stupid things. Um, if you're smart, you won't burn them out. But if you, if you get stressed out by you know the uh, contractor who's trying to you know work outside your house, outside he's like, look at the circuits now. So without flipping the right things, you just put them in the outlet and burn it out. And smoke rises. Yeah, I got a lot of these kind of scorch. Fun. It's out of five expensive ones. And actually, that's kind of the theme behind a lot of this. You know, it's similar to the mini color. Um, I don't have the funds to uh, uh, do expensive projects where I'm going to break things. Um, and that's what's nice about this. The lock itself is twelve dollars. Our Duinos are pretty cheap. Um, you know, so I, better equipment is definitely better. But, but cheaper actually lets me get the foot in the door. Uh, so the first thing I did then was kind of power it on. Um, kind of okay. What's interesting? I bet there's signals on this uh, on this chip, you know. And actually, I was hoping it would be for some reason outputting the code that I read out on a pin of the chip, and I didn't really find anything that was doing that. Um, the actual code, like the one, the, the the number that's on the card. But what I did find is that one of these pins, pin 16, um, on the chip. Uh, Shows 2.9 volts, which is it's interesting because if you're doing all the pins, and pretty much that one's a ground, you know, it's zero volts, zero volts, five volts, five volts, zero volts, um, which pretty much tells you it's either kind of a pin that's just setting that this is high in something or this is low, or there's not really a lot going on. But here, seeing at 2.9 volts, um, there's a good chance that there's actually a data signal on that pin. Um, you know, and it, it, my multi tester is averaging, you know, when the signal is high at five volts and the signal is low at zero volts, down to some average that's 2.9. So that's an interesting pin, um, and probably other ones as well. Um, so I want to know more about it. Um, it's probably the most expensive component I have. Uh, I'd love to get a, a oscilloscope. I don't have one. Um, maybe now that I've got a few extra bucks, I'll have a couple things here. I can buy one. But um, what I do have is this really cheap logic analyzer. I got it for like 40 bucks off of eBay. Uh, it's a knockoff of the Seela brand. Um, but basically what it does, it's like an oscilloscope where it's measuring signals, but it only measures whether it's a zero or one. It doesn't measure the actual analog. It's just up, down, up, down. Oops. What happened here? What the heck? Sorry about that. There we go. All right. So, um, we use the logic analyzer in a second, but I want to talk about grounding because this is another place I kind of got stuck. You know, because you always forget kind of if I've got two boards, you know, whether it's Arduino on another board or the logic analyzer on another board, or two boards that are trying to talk to each other, um, they need to have a common ground. You think like do they connect the grounds together? They're they're both running off a different power supply or something. Um, yes, you connect the grounds together in any case that I've come across anyway. And the reason for that is um, if this board is sending a signal to this board. Uh, it's sending voltage compared to ground. And each board probably has a different sense of what ground is. If you check the voltage across both grounds, you'd see that it was not zero volts. There was something there. Uh, you connect them together, they both decide, okay, we're going to share this common ground, and whatever's not that ground is a signal I can understand. So uh, uh, one of the things that took me a little while, and I always kind of said, why aren't I getting a good signal? Oh, I forgot the ground board that I'm looking at or whatever. So you've got to connect the grounds together. 
And so what I've actually got here is, is that board, and I've soldered on to, or I've, I've clamped, um, so I've clamped onto the ground pin, or, yeah, ground pin on that chip, and um, pin 16 on that chip. And I'm going to launch my logic analyzer. And it's just going to come back and collect some samples. And it's, it's running really fast, so they're all packed in there right now. So I spread that out. So this is what it's seeing. It's seeing up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Um, and it's nice enough to tell me way over here on the right-hand side, the frequency is 125 kilohertz. So that's really interesting. I know these EM400 cards that I'm using that run at 125 kilohertz. So that's like an RFID signal on that pin. Um, and it's just a, a, an even one like that. Um, so that's really cool. What happens if we put a key by it? So I'm going to time it off here. Click start. And I'm going to do that again because it's kind of slow. Oh. I've got the reader upside down, so it uh, doesn't read as well as it reads. Um, so if that looks like the same signal, I'm going to zoom way out. Oh, there's something interesting happened. And, you know, with a little trial and error, I figured out this was the exact point at which it had read a signal and, you know, either stopped trying to read a signal or opened the lock or something. So what happened right before that? Zoom in on that. Well, that's really interesting. I'm seeing not that 125 kilohertz signal anymore. I'm seeing, you know, if I zoom way in, this is 125 kilohertz right here, about 125 kilohertz. So there's another signal that's kind of overlaid on top of that that looks like this. Okay, time to do a little research. What does this signal mean? So, looked into the M400 cards I'm using, um, and they use something called Manchester encoding. And the way that works is if you have uh, a binary one, it actually encodes a low high. So, binary one is low high, binary zero is high low. And that signal that I see there matches the signal that I, I read. And the way I can kind of tell that is I've pretty much got um, bits that seem to be either one bit wide or two bits wide. And I don't see anything more than two bits wide, you know, and so it's really even, you know, so that's really likely I'm catching that signal. That's interesting. How can I, and I'm just seeing that in my scope, how can I actually do something with that? Um, we'll get back to the protocol decoding. Uh, but how do I do something with that? Well, I, uh, I can sense that that up, that high low on the Arduino pin. I don't know if I'll be able to do much with it, but I can sense it there. So hooked it up to the Arduino. Um, to do that, I uh, soldered onto that that pin on the board. I actually soldered on the bottom board that's going around. You'll see that. Um, so this is the only tool um, that I don't recommend going with the cheapest you find. And I wouldn't buy one of the Harbor Freight tools. Um, you get a good one, it lasts a long time, it works well. So Weller's a good brand. Uh, mine's actually that I use is from Radio Shack. It's the only thing I would probably ever buy at Radio Shack. And it's like cheap. Um, but there's a nice one too. But most people like the Weller as well. So I soldered onto the pins. Um, just look at the white and gray wire. So the white wire I've got soldered onto the pin 16. The gray wire is onto a ground pin. The other two um, was for kind of as I, I went along, I was trying to get also some power off the board and things like that. Uh, another little bit of, of things you need to jump into as you're getting into this hardware hacking is um, thinking more in binary. This was also a shift for me. It's been a long time since I had to think in binary. Um, but Arduino makes it nice because you've got this uh, uh, notation where for a, a byte, and eight, eight bits of, of ones and zeros, um, you can do B11110. So you actually see on the screen what that byte is. Uh, but you also got to think in hex because a lot of your output will be printing in hex. And so that 111100 is hex FC. Uh, the first four bytes correspond to the F, the second four bytes correspond to the C. So um, don't be afraid of binary and hex. Um, just kind of get used to it a little bit to get started. Um, the other thing, as I was trying to do some work with this on the Arduino, was really had to pay a lot of attention to data types because there was there's not a lot of space on that Arduino, and I'm trying to catch a big big signal and then decode it. And so, um, you know, I had to make sure I was using all the memory very efficiently, which again was new because I was decoding it for all the Python. I was like, unlimited whatever you need. Um, and I used a lot of byte arrays, so that was kind of the things. So how did I turn that that signal that the, the board got into um, 
into something interesting. Well, the way I decided to do it was I know that the Arduino has a certain, um, it's very much a, a solid and consistent processing. It doesn't have, at least I'm not using it or else to go off to other things. So for the same thing, it's always going to count the same number of times. Um, so what I did is just start a loop that reads that pin, counts, reads that pin, counts. So it's going across the bottom here, right now the pin's high, so it starts counting high, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and the pin goes low and it stops, okay, it's seven. I went to loop seven times, I'm going to write seven to a buffer, and then reset my counter. Now it's low, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, up, oh, it went high. So I'm going to write eight to my buffer, reset my counter, and I just did that. So I had a buffer with basically how many, how many times did the Arduino do that loop before the state changed. And what I got out of that was, was this uh, count you see on the bottom. So um, it counted 73 loops, then the state changed, zero loops, the state changed, one loop, the state changed. So those zeros and ones, I don't know if you noticed when we stretched out that signal, there was a little bit of 125 kilohertz in between the next signal. Um, so I just ignore that. I'm really looking for the long ones that are like 70 or 120. But I, I still think I'm on the right track here because I'm seeing 70, 50, 130. So it's like X and 2X. I'm seeing signals that are this wide and signals that are twice that wide, and then some quick ones in between. So it seems like I'm on the right path. Um, the Arduino right now is just shipping this out to the serial port, and I'm catching it, capturing it in a text editor and, and doing a little bit, you know, working with it there. Um, but once, once I got that, how do I convert that into something meaningful again? Um, and so the way I did that was I just wrote a loop on the Arduino that if it sees between 50 and 70 um, counts before the state change, that's a, that's a 1. If it sees, well, it knows whether it's a 1 or a 0. I was kind of tracking that. I always started with a 1. So depending on where I was with the buffer, I know it was a 1 or a 0. But if it sees 70, it says, OK, that's just one byte. If it sees 120, 140, okay, that was two bytes. So it writes one, zero, zero, one, zero, and it just makes a new buffer stream like that. Um, and that's what that ends up looking like. I think I got to shift that down to your part, but it still seems like I'm on the right trail because my Manchester encoding should always be one, zero, or zero, one. And that's what I see here. It's one, zero, one, zero, zero, one. I never see three of the same one or zero together. So, you know, looking good on the right path. Uh, this is kind of the size of the buffer that I could store on the Arduino before it kind of ran out of memory. And then we just need to decode that. The way we do that again is a one zero is a one, uh, or, uh, or sorry, a zero one is a one, or a zero one is a one. Um, so we'll go and do that. So then we get the string of just ones and zeros again, but it's the real signal, it's, it's, it, it represents what's on the key. Convert that into, I think it's 40, I don't know how many bytes it is overall for the key, I forget. But there's a really nice uh, layout of the protocol somewhere on the web I found. Uh, it starts with nine ones, which is nice. So I just need to look in my buffer for some place that has nine ones. Find that nine ones, okay, that could be the start of a key. Uh, the next one, two, three, four bytes are, are, are a version number, the first half version number. Uh, there's some parity that's there. So it's, it's some math there to figure out, okay, this blue block in the middle is actually my, my data that I'm looking for. Um, and you know, I, I do some parity checks and all that, but it's basically just you know a little more math to figure out from that string of ones and zeros. You know, what do I got? And so we'll uh, we'll show the end result here. So, and I've got my Arduino code says starting when it's working, which is nice, and when I scan a badge, um, it saw the number 1872006, which is the same number printed on the outside of the key. So, that was pretty cool. Understanding of how the, the key works. Um, if you look at the key on the inside, 
got a picture of it there. You've got the coil that's the conductor, the coil of wire. So, um, and then somewhere in that little board in the middle, they've got a capacitor and the other logic um, uh, on the actual key that came with the lock. Um, and so I learned that uh, to do this uh, tuned circuit, the 225 kilohertz, you need an inductor and then you need a capacitor that matches to that they resonate at 25 kilohertz. Um, I bought one, this little one you see down at the bottom off of a, a, company, a website called Coilcraft. Um, I Basically, uh, 
made that little circuit, soldered the inductor on. Initially, I soldered on the coil craft inductor. It was like a buck each, and I bought more than one, so I was, you know, money thrown at it. And then I realized um, when that wasn't working well, well, I got another inductor. It's inside this blue key, probably, and I figured out how to pry these open and get into them. It's not too hard. Um, but these work great um, when you when you get the right right uh, capacitor for them. Um, and on the website, it tells how to do that. I can link you to that. But you have to figure out the right capacitor to tip the circuit 25 kilohertz. But pop one of these open. Um, the wires are really fine. You can't really solder them too easily. But it's got a couple solder points next to that circuit that they've got in there. I just took a knife and kind of cut their circuit up until it wasn't working anymore, and then soldered to their solder points. Um, and it worked. Um, so. So what I have here is a uh, little Arduino Nano um, with that, that reader you just saw. I've got it connected to the mini forward battery. Um, okay. And I'm going to switch over to the start this over so you can see. Um, 
the, the, the bits are shorter, so you've got you know a lot more errors in terms of the, the Arduino trying to count. You know, it only counts nine or ten bits before the state changes, so more errors there. Um, what I really found was the problem, though, was the hit card has a much longer code. It's not just the, the few bytes that, that the AM counter card is. So I had to create a bigger buffer to store more counts, and it's, it's shorter counts. So I had to create a much bigger buffer to store more counts and try and catch that card. Um, the standard Arduino Uno has enough memory to catch, uh, you know, maybe 30 percent more than a full card read um, in a buffer, but it doesn't really have enough room left for your program than the memory. So I could either catch too short of a buffer or not have enough room for my program. Um, the uh, the way I kind of got around that is I was able to at least fill my buffer and then just have a tiny bit of code that spits the buffer out via serial. Done the, did the decode offline, like on a, on a Windows machine, and proved that yeah, it can be done. I ultimately, when I was done, you know, doing some math uh, and all that kind of stuff, came up with the number that was on the back of the like, yeah, it can be done. Um, but my goal was um, to, to make this into like a pen testing tool. I want to take take the, the reader itself, pack the little Arduino Nano in there. Uh, pack the board from uh, like one of the TP Link routers in there, and you have that serial port and web page, and then the pack of batteries. And I was actually able to fit, you know, the, the Arduino, the mini corner um, uh, board, and the uh, and like six AA batteries inside one of these that I bought a little bit with its case. It's this one right here. So all inside there, I can pack all that in there. Runs off batteries, stick it to a wall, pan and plaque, and it'll just like everybody else's reader. Put it right next to them, and you know they're going to swipe both or whatever. Um, but I couldn't get far enough where I could read. Uh, with the EF400, I could read the other uh, Ruby Arduino, send it to the mini corner, put it on a web page on the mini corner, and actually see that web page, you know, standing on the front and that type of thing. So that was cool, but I couldn't do it with the hit cards because, um, you know, I could write C code on the mini corner to do the decode. I could put all the mini corner, but then I need two USB ports. So a lot of hurdles there. I don't have it working yet. It'd be cool if someone could get that far. I saw somebody else had some Arduino code out there for decoding these with, I think they were using the same signal input. Um, but he was doing some smart things that I was for sure, um, where he was actually time, using the timer on, on the Arduino to time the length of the, the, the ups or downs rather than just count them and things like that. Um, but his code didn't work when I tried it, so I don't know what the problem was. Or you could use a more powerful Arduino board that's more memory and more hertz or whatever. Um, but that's still out there. It can be done. Um, you can be very smart if you can do it. Um, I haven't been able to do it yet. But that's what I was talking about. The mini corner RFID, packing all that in there. Um, again, thanks. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This information, I've got some of it out there on mini-corner.com, but mini-corner RFID. I'm going to get kind of the parts list for this stuff out there so you can do it. Um, the schematic out there. Uh, if you're here, and you, uh, if you want to email me, if you really want one of these boards, uh, I'll probably make another batch and I can add you one. Just email me. Uh, go to mini-corner.com and find my address or whatever there. Uh, yeah. Cool. That's awesome.